These are supposed to be some of the most verified images of giants. People who do meditation for 60 days will lengthen their telomeres. Soon we'll get results and we'll let you know right here on Beyond Belief. Things seem to be changing in the field of ufology. It's gonna be a bumpy ride. That's priceless. Isn't that amazing? Tesla wanted free energy, and look what happened to him. Plenty of evidence to show that they're real. The real question is how and why. There were Egyptian hieroglyphs out in the outback of Australia. In Australia. What are the possibilities Mars was inhabited, and these were built? We almost can't duplicate today. These are amazing topics. What if there was something like an Area 51 deep underwater? They were killed by some animal. Believe me, we're just getting started. I'm George Norrie, and we here at Gaia are committed to revealing the truth. Hello there, Coast to Coast AM, Connie Willis with you. How are you? Thanks for finding me and following me on Twitter and, and Facebook and all the other things. It's uh, very hard to keep up with all the outlets. So if you ever want to just know what I'm doing and see what's happening, go to ConnieWillis.com. That's where my podcast information, which is Connie Willis, the podcast, and also my shows, Connie After Dark, my live virtual bar where what happens there stays there, and then it's never archived. <laughs> uh, and a lot of things happen there, by the way. And uh, that money is to help the proceeds of the show Blue Rock Talk. We got a big night tonight. We're talking UFOs. We have great guests tonight that really know their stuff, and they have their witnesses to what they're going to talk about. And then they have continued to work with these, uh, what they've seen to tell the world that this is true, that this is real, and they haven't let up. And I want to compliment them, and that's why they're here tonight, too. And so let's get tonight to uh, our first guest, because now, now later on tonight, right, we're going to be talking about the Phoenix Lights. Um, very surprised that I've heard different things from different people, but we'll talk about that later. Looking forward to talking to uh, Lynn about all this. Okay, now before that, though, joining me is Thomas Reed. He's founder of Miami Models and son of an attorney and politician, and he is one of the key witnesses to the Berkshires UFO incident. Now, he's going to detail tonight, this is the 1969 Berkshires UFO incident. Thank you for putting UFO in there. And he also is going to talk about his family's connection to the space race and we're going to be discussing the city of Roswell's research library, who's assisted the Massachusetts Historical Society and their lawyer who helped to formally induct Reed's incident into the state record as historically true. That's huge, right? That's huge. And that's making it the first UFO incident to be officially archived in the UN, in the United Nations. So pretty, pretty cool. And that is a Tom Reed. Tom Reed is our guest tonight. He's been here on here before. I had found him kind of going through Facebook or something like that. And I was like, wow. And I looked a little deeper into him because he had a really cool picture with these cool glasses. And I was like, who is this? So I looked and he, you know, boom, he's the guy. Everything I just described to you. But also he's got a background of my background, which is in TV and 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 in uh, acting and modeling talent agency, you know, stuff like that, where you have to audition and and branding and, and things like that. So it was really cool to meet someone that also has the same background and is surviving in the world of this because it, it's not always easy. Dog eat dog in all areas that we've been in along the way. Thomas Reed. Uh, you can find him, by the way, at thomasereed.com, thomasereed.com. Learn more about him. Uh, Thomas, welcome to Coast to Coast AM. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for uh, having me, Connie. And you know, when I'm, it comes to uh, acronyms, I run with UFO also. I don't get into this UAP thing. So just we're, we've got a similarity there as well. So. I know, right? Oh, my uh, gosh. When I hear that, I'm always like, huh? What? What did? D huh? <laughs> yeah. I don't you. know why it irks me so much, but it does. Okay, so tell us your story because yeah. 
there's a lot involved. It's not just witnessing, but it's also really getting into making it like, you know, happen in the books. So uh, first of all, just tell me about the actual incident that you had. Sure. Sure. Well, uh, the area back in uh, in the Berkshires back in the 60s, there was a lot of activity uh, over a, like a three or four year period. Uh, this particular one, uh, 1969, it was actually Labor Day. And that was one of the reasons that uh, it uh, had gotten so many witnesses to it. Like over 250 witnesses, you know, saw these uh, uh, crafts, if you will, in and around the Berkshires, primarily Sheffield. And uh, it being a holiday, my, my mother, um, she, well, she had a diner, and we were going back to the diner to close it up for the night. And um, so my brother was with me, my grandmother, my grandmother Marion, and uh, my mother, who was 29 years old at the time. And uh, we were in a station wagon, so there was four of us. And when we uh, got to the diner, you know, she basically cleaned up, let the, let the cook go, made the night deposit drop. And as it uh, got to be about 8.15, I guess, uh, a little after dark, uh, we had the lights on, so it was, had been dark. It was dark maybe 10 or 15 minutes or so. It was dusk. And, um, and to get home in time for school the next day, my mother decided to take a shortcut. And she actually decided to go through the Sheffield Covered Bridge, which at the time was one of the oldest bridges in New England. And um, and sure enough, so my mother was driving, my grandmother was in the passenger seat, my brother was to the right of me, and uh, again, I, I was behind the driver. And so as we went through this old rickety bridge, um, as we came out the other side, um, I was giving my brother a candy. And my grandmother had turned around to basically tell me not to give him uh, anything because he could choke. <laughs> and he was so much younger, right? But you don't want him to choke, right? And um, this road that we were heading down was very bumpy, potholes. You could only go like five or 10 miles an hour. And so as we were heading down this road... Um, and by the way, was, Tom, uh, yeah. just mm -hmm. by the way, you're already going down by a bridge and a rickety road. It's already spooky, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it it kind of was. It, it, the whole thing was kind of ominous, you know? And, and, and so... As she's talking to me, she notices this white sphere. The whole thing started with this white sphere, and it looked like a cue ball from a pool table. It wasn't bleeding light. It wasn't, um, you, you know, uh, forming different shapes. It was solid. It was crisp. And um, it came up from the banks of the Housatonic River. You know, some people said, you know, they thought it came out of the water. Um, I remember it rising up, and when I, by the time I saw it, it was lifting up, and it was about ground level at the time, coming up from this deeper uh, river area, and it rose to about uh, two to three uh, stories, perhaps, and we kept going, but we were only going again like five or ten miles an hour, so we weren't losing sight of it. I mean, it was within, I'd say, 30 yards of us, and it was probably the size of four Volkswagen Beetles. Now, that's how I... I remember we had a beetle too, so I um it had to be at least you know four times that size, and it was dead quiet um, as it rose up. Um, you know, again, it was we were clear view of all of us. It was a hot night. The windows in the car were open, and we didn't have air conditioning. And uh, my brother and I were you know staring at this thing as my grandmother was. My mom was still driving, but she's trying to look at it as well. And she went to find a spot to pull over. And as we were heading down the road now, the, the, the thing rose up probably even a little bit higher, and then it shot these two rods into the water. So for a moment or two, it looked like an ice cream cone. You know how it comes to a point? Yeah, and yeah. So these, uh -huh. these rods just shot into the water. And I remember that because, you know, as, as a kid, I kind of remember or I relate things. When I see things, I'm like, yeah, that's what it looked like, you know, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, it very much looked like an ice cream cone. And that lasted maybe, I'm going to guess, you know, 10 to 30 seconds or so, and then they retracted into it out of the bottom, and then it continued to go in the direction we were going, but what's now a cornfield. So it went behind this line of trees in the same direction we're going in, but we lost sight of it. And when I say gave, gave out like a, a glow or a, a sheen or something, it was like a two-watt bulb. It wasn't super bright, but it was definitely bright enough that you could see it clearly. And so at that point, my brother is trying to also see it because he's kind of blocked by, by us. And he, he ended up looking at the right side of the car, and he had seen what looked like an orange sphere, very similar in its structure, how it was crisp and, and um, tightly, you know, tightly together. 
Um, and, uh, you know, so we kind of split those, you know, so one was at uh, nine o'clock and the orange one was probably at three o'clock and we kind of split those. That one never rose. It stayed near the water. It was much smaller. It had a roll to it. There was something going on with it, but we split them and continued down this road. And there was an area near a telephone pole where utility trucks would, would stop back in the day. This when road, you said you would split people. them, what did you mean by that when you said we, well, there was we split one, them? Yeah, it was one on our left and one on our right. So we just kind of went right between them. Oh, so okay. The one, yeah, so the one on the left was probably 30 to 40 yards away from us. The one on the right was more like uh, 60 or 80 yards away from us, almost probably a football field away from us. But we did cut. We were right between them. So, yeah, so one would have been at, um, you know, ten, like 9 o'clock, and the other would have been about 3 o'clock. So we kind of cut them. Went down this dirt road near this little rest area, if you will, near a telephone pole. And that's where there was a clearing to the left. So my mother originally had thought that we were going to stop there and we were going to be able to see this big white sphere again. And like I said, there was a lot of activity uh, uh, back in the day. I mean, people were seeing things all the time. So we weren't a novice to seeing things in the area any more than anyone else was. And, but this was the one of the times that this was close to us. So, you know, we weren't scared. We weren't leaving. We weren't like going in the opposite direction. I mean, it was right there. We wanted to see it. We wanted to get a, a close-up look at what this was. So and, you were fascinated uh, at this point. And hey, let's go check it out. Let's see it. Yeah, I would say, you know, because back in the day when you see something like that and you're telling your friends and you're mentioning it in the restaurant or diner, if you will, you know, people are mocking you and making fun. So you're like, you know, now everyone's in the car. You know, we're right. all seeing it together. Let's, what is this friggin' thing, right? That was yeah. kind of the attitude about it. And at that point, you know, my mother looked over the field, and that is when we saw what looked very much like a giant turtle shell hovering about three stories up. It, uh, the top of it had like a pattern to it, like a, I say a turtle shell because it looked like it had, um, you know, it had lines and, and uh, the side of it looked very much like a, a snake skin, you know, mm. kind of, it almost looked alive, you know, it had that eerie, alive feeling to it. And uh, there was no landing gear. There were no windows. There, um, there was no light that I remember really coming out the bottom of it. What the light that we saw really came from the shell itself as if it was given out um, some type of machine. And the, the top right of it, you know, facing the front of our car, if you will, was quite a ways away. It was probably 100 yards away or so, but it was also about 100 yards in size. And this thing was massive, and it just looked, again, really like if you took two turtle shells and, you know, put them together like together, you know. I mean, it looked that simple and that um, – uh, it didn't have anything high tech to it. It didn't look at very. It didn't look like it's uh, you know, like you'd see on, online or anything. It didn't. It just looked like, you know, sounds like a nut like now a, when you t- put the two turtle like, turtle yeah, shells together. Yeah, it's like, kind of like, like a, a nut. weird, almost like <laughs> a rock, right? It had that kind of a weird feel to it, and it just mm. hovered there. And at that point, what we felt was it was like being deep underwater. You know, my, my mother used to use uh, the term that it felt uh, tight, her chest felt tight, almost like a, like being wrapped in saran wrap or something. Like it was becoming hard to breathe. Um, I remember um, hearing this tapping sound, like uh, stones hitting underneath the thunder wall of the car, but we weren't moving anymore. You know, we had stopped. And it was this ting, ting, ting. That's kind of what I remember. And, um, and, you know, we're looking out the window. We're trying to see if it's moving. It just sat there, nothing. Just this weird vibe came over us. And um, there was this, uh, like, a, a flash of light, and then everything in the car was, you know, we could see everything, the radio knobs, you know, the back of my mother's hair, you know, everything in the car lit up. But it wasn't like a dome light, but it was super bright, uh, but nothing bothered our eyes. And we all just kind of were in, like, Plastic, I guess, you know, we were just kind of like looking at each other and then bang, there was a, a eruption of katias and crickets and frogs. And it was like life just came back again. Like it had just erupted in, in this, you know, uh, you know, all at once. Right. Cause it, it was like, if we, we had been in like this vacuum of, of silence, if you will. And then that vacuum left and then everything came back to life. Tonight we are talking UFOs and we've got, Thomas E. Reed with us, 
like to be called Tom Reed, but if you'd like to find him, go to Thomas E. Reed, and you're going to learn a whole lot of things. And that's Thomas, make sure that H is in there, then an E, and then Reed, which is R-E-E-D dot com. And Tom, I think you have a couple other links as well. Yeah, um, UFO uh, Expo for our event dot com, uh, UFO Expo dot com for the expo, and um, then of course uh, Berkshire's UFO dot com for a lot of the uh, information that's about what I'm talking about tonight um, is on that uh, site. Uh, Berkshire's UFO is the name of the, uh, if you will, the Unsolved Mysteries episode that uh, uh, detailed a lot of um, what happened in our case and a lot of the witnesses. So. Um, with that, um, yeah, uh, BerkshireUFO.com uh, has a lot about uh, – actually, have, even has some uh, footage from behind the scenes of film and Netflix and Unsolved Mystery. So, yeah, that's a great site too. Now, before we get back to the story, I just want to ask you because, uh, you know, being in, being in the biz as well, how was it when you were on Unsolved Mysteries and they were showing your story? Did they, did they depict it correctly? I think they did a pretty good job um, with, with respect to uh, the flight path that it took and the witnesses, uh, because at that point, too, um, back in the 60s, I mean, there were a lot of things that um, you can't fit it all into one little episode of Netflix, right? So, But there were, uh, you know, the uh, DJ, if you will, um, who ran the WSBS radio, uh, Tom J., he was actually asked to go back to the station and go on the air and cut into the reel-to-reel to ask people for help spotting this thing. and. And Jan Green, who was in the episode, uh, who used to uh, own and run uh, Rexall Pharmacy, um, she actually ran down to uh, the radio station, pounded on the door, and, and said, if you come outside, you can see it yourself. It's right there over, over Sheffield. And there was a, uh, like a golf tournament at Jug End where the incident got its uh, kind of classification, if you will, and those golfers had seen it. And a lot of the people that were playing golf at Jug End, you know, they had uh, – call back into the station too. So a lot of these sightings that were uh, being uh, recorded by people or seen by individuals in the area. Um, and again, it was a lot of people uh, with others who didn't normally hang with those people, you know, cause it, it was Labor Day, it was a holiday. So there were, there were events going on. So it wasn't like one family saw this and one family saw that there were groups of 10, 20, 40 people at, at one time that were seeing us together and, and, uh, and they were all calling into the radio station. And the next I like morning, that, you know, yeah, that's I, kind of what I like that TV. because, yeah. yeah, and you know what, it's because a lot of those people would never, ever have either, you know, ever admitted to seeing something or would probably never have believed in it. And then they get to see it. All the different groups of people get to see it. And then it's like, all right, you know, yeah, now that we got more cool. believers, right? Yeah, pretty much. That's kind of what it was. Yeah, that's kind of why it uh, it got the attention that it did. I mean, it's a fairly small town, but it, uh, you know, was seen by five or six. And it started in Connecticut. It went all the way to Pittsfield, and then went through Lenox and Stockbridge near Tanglewood, where um, Arlo Guthrie, you know, used to be. Alice's Restaurant was up there. Uh-huh. They went through the town that uh, Story Musgrave used to live in. He actually went. Uh, he actually didn't live far from me, Story Musgrave, the astronaut. And so then it came down through uh, Great Barrington and went by uh, Lake Mansfield, where uh, Melanie Kirchdorfer saw it, who was in Unsolved Mysteries. Um, you know, she used to come into our, our restaurant and order these grilled cheese sandwiches with onions. I mean, that was her thing. And, what was uh, the name of your family restaurant? Oh, it was the Village Green. The Village yeah. Green. It's still there today, actually. It's under Roberto's. It's a it's a pizza house. Great pizza, by the way, if you're ever up that way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Robbie runs it. It's Call la, 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 yeah, <laughs> and order your so, pizza tonight. <laughs> yeah, so it was kind of one of those things that, um, you know, the topic itself had kind of divided the community, you know, and, and this particular night kind of brought it all together, but it was so barbaric and harsh, you know, like I was trying to say earlier, it wasn't like a, what a lot of other people experience. I mean, you know, it did look very solid and, and simple. And like I said, a turtle shell and it was this weird vibe and, and the way it affected, you know, everything around us and how we felt and kind of muted, like I said, like being pushed to the deep end of a swimming pool and then these echoing sounds. And it, it was kind of spooky. Like you said earlier, even the bridge, right. was kind of, Spooky in its own way, I guess. I go back there now, and I do get um, there is a, a haunting feel when I'm mm. there. You know, when I walk. Usually, down the bridges, road. bridges always have the woman in white that walks by. You know, there's always something like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so well, maybe that there's make it a little bit nicer if I walk down there and like a woman with with a light. I'm like, oh my god, thank you. 
You know, because it does. There's no, there really isn't much light down there. It's, it's dark. It's uh, rustic. It's, uh, it doesn't look much different than it did the day it happened. You know, uh, I go back down there and it's quite reminiscent. You know, did did you have more to add to the story when we had to take a break to finish oh, yeah. it out? Yeah, okay, not, please yeah, please go from there. Um, yeah, please. So so again, this is um when I when I when I say when I came to like like I said we were we sometimes think that the, the the three objects were communicating with each other and that's why our brains felt the way that we did. We've always tried to rationalize it and try to make sense of it. But when I came to after you know that eruption of crickets and cadias and everything. I just remember sliding off something I was sitting on. I don't really know what it was. I don't remember looking back at it. And my left arm was squeezed very, very hard. I remember the lights were, the, like I said, the walls met the ceiling. It was like a, a singular light and then a space, a light of space, a light of space. And it So what I me, hear you saying is that you were taken and you're talking about the inside of the ship. No, I don't think it was inside the ship. Nope. No, I don't, because where okay. I was was much bigger than the craft that we saw. Oh. And and where this empty area was, I, I say it looked like an airplane hangar because my mother oh. used to be a pilot too. My mother used to fly. And but you were somewhere. Okay, I got you. I got oh, you. Oh yeah, no, I was okay. I have no idea where I was exactly. But and okay. this is why I I I want to describe in detail where I was because maybe someone else listening has an idea. Yeah, please. Uh, yes. So the the floor was hard almost I'm I would like to say like an asphalt or a concrete, but I don't know for sure, but it wasn't anything, you know, it was, it certainly wasn't wood or carpet, you know, and the area itself was open. Like I didn't see anything in there, but there was enough light that I could see that it was empty. I don't know what the ceiling looked like, uh, but at this point, I mean, this was, like I said, as big as an airplane hangar, and I was grabbed by my left arm right around where the muscle is, my left muscle, my left arm, pushed out this door where there was a light. I was taken out a hallway. Uh, the hallway was very, that had tall white walls, very narrow hallway. And at the end, it either went left or right. And I was taken to the left and then into the uh, right, which was this another area, which was much smaller. And there was a table and there was a glass, like a, um, a wall made of like, reminded me of glass brick. You know, when you're a kid, you had those glass brick. So almost like a, an MRI room. And there was a pocket to the left where you could, again, go out somewhere. And then a pocket to the right where you could also, you know, seem to exit that area. And I'd say this room was probably 30 by 30. And again, I was sitting on a table that reminded me a lot of an autopsy table because it had one pole in the middle. Um, I was just staring at this glass area, what looked like glass. I'm not saying it was glass. I don't know what it was. And then, uh, you know, I'd be, you were by yourself, not your family around. Yeah, you? that was by myself. And no clothes or clothes. Do you have clothes no, on? I was dressed. I was dressed at this point. I was. Mm. And um, and mm. I just remember staring at this glass in area, and um, and then there was what reminded me a lot of uh, was very disturbing. Reminded me a lot of a, uh, an ant. An ant head, a uh, thin body, uh, legs and arms. It reminded me of bamboo with with like wine rings around them, um, probably four and a half to five feet tall. They looked, reminded me of uh, an ant standing on its back legs. And, um, and there were two. Um, at one point, uh, one turned in my direction. I remember running out the right corner of this room into another large hallway, um, which again was as big as an empty Walmart, for God's sakes. It was huge. I had no idea what to do when I got into the past that uh, entryway. Um, I stopped. There were markings on the floor, and it looked like gray markings on the floor. Uh, the floor was white, too. Walls were white. Ceiling was white. But this area was more of a circle. And on, in like over the circle, there was like a Y shape of hallways. And there was a hallway to my right. There was a hallway almost directly across from me. And then far down on the left, it looked like this big open area, which was as wide as like a four-lane highway. And I stopped, so I was pulled back in. I remember like this horrible uh, boiling water running through my shoulders and my arms and my back. Um, I was put down on this uh, the table that I was sitting on earlier when I was facing that 
glassed in area. Um, a cage like came over me. It separated into two. One kind of went over my body, but I was able. I could have slid out. I guess it wasn't really tight against my body. And then the second part went over that one. So this cage broke into two pieces, and then one came over me, and the other one came over that. And there were these holes uh, in the side of it. And these hands came through and placed what reminded me a lot of raisins, black, you know, raisins, but the size of maybe a mouse for a computer, you know, mm. the size of a cigarette pack. And they were adhered to my skin. Mm. Uh, there was a hit to my head. I remember hearing voices. I remember what I think was my mother's voice, um, maybe my grandmother's. I did hear someone calling out. Um, I remember these, like I said, these hits to my head. I was back in the, uh, the room that I was originally brought to, um, which looked like the airplane hangar. And um, I remember being there for a little bit. And then the next thing I know, um, I, I woke up basically in the car. I came to in the car. Was everybody else with you at that point? Mm -hmm. Were they back in the car, the rest of the family? Yeah. So my when I came to um, was after my grandmother had already driven back to town. So mm. when... When we got back to the car, if you will, my grandmother was the only one, or the first one, I should say, to come to. And she was now in the driver's seat when she had been in the passenger seat. So my mother was now with where my grandmother was. So they switched places. So my grandmother was now driving. My brother was still to the right of me, and I was still behind the driver's seat. But again, my mother and grandmother were reversed. And the lights were off, the ignition was off, and the car was no longer running. So my grandmother, to this you know, day, would say, yeah, I had to start the car. She didn't, nobody was responding to her. My mother wasn't answering to her, you know, her calls. She was shaking my mother. She was trying to wake people up. She was the only one uh, awake at the time, but she didn't drive. Like I mentioned, in Unsolved Mystery, she didn't even have a car, right? So, but now she's got to turn the station wagon around in this narrow dirt road and get back to town because town was only like, a, you know, uh, a mile away versus her home being like 10 miles away. So she wanted some help because nobody in the car was responding to her. So she went back to Silk store, which was not far from ours. You could walk to it from our store. And uh, she you know, pulled up the silks when she got out of the car at about the time that I came to. I remember calling my grandmother going, Nana, Nana, you know, that kind of thing. And I ran out the back door of the car and I kind of ran in the store with her. And um, at that point, my mother was still unconscious. My brother's head had been on my leg when I got up. I mean, his head like hit the seat. I mean, he was just out of it. And so when she went in to ask for help, but she never really asked him for anything. When we went in, she just kind of walked straight to the back of the store um, I was trying to grab her arm and stuff and pull her, but she had walked behind like these bikes and strollers and things that were for sale in there. You know, it was like a, uh, an old convenience store type of thing that sold a little bit of everything, you know, general store. And, uh, and, and so I'm still pulling her, her arm and the owner of silk store came over to us and, you know, are you okay. And she never really said much because the paramedics never showed up. He never actually called the police, but if he had, we would have known that the police were already dispatched and that the chief of police, Galata, and his son, Eddie Galata, were already out looking for this thing that had landed in the fields. And that came from Tom Jay leaving his home. He was a ham radio operator, had gone back to the radio station, got opened up the, the uh, lines for the AM you know, station at the time. It was WSBS AM, and had said, you know, people, call, please call the, the station. Let us know where this thing is. And they had, and they identified it over Sheffield, which is one of the reasons that when Unsolved Mysteries showed the police officer opening up the books, you know, we don't see any reports from that day. Well, you know, there wasn't any reports from, from Great Barrington because the, the craft was seen and the reports came to Sheffield. That's why you'll see the Hedy Galata in Unsolved Mysteries pointing up above the, the doorway saying, well, that was my father. He was He's the son of the chief of police from Sheffield. And he and his father had actually been dispatched to go look for this thing in the fields around the town of Sheffield. And so with that said, um, you know, the next morning we went home. Um, the next morning uh, we went back to open up our, our diner, the Village on the Green. And uh, in doing so, um, you know, the, we turned on the radio and, and sure enough, you know, there was so-and-so that we knew from the area and other people were eating. Like, that's my sister. Or that's my brother. And it, was, it kind of brought people together. It didn't really divide people at that, that point. I think people wanted to, to know they weren't alone, you know, that they had seen something that, uh, you know, really troubled them earlier, too. And now they were validated, you know, by all these other people, um, you know, being part of what they were 
you know, some, you know, years prior. Did the other members of your family have stories like you later when you all got to talk about it? Or, you know, because like you remembered a lot. Most people don't even remember anything. So how did that go with other people you met in your family? My brother uh, remembers a lot of attention being brought to his club foot. He had a brace on his leg mm-hmm. and his, his, his heel didn't hit the, the ground um, far enough. So um, he remembers attention to that. My grandmother remembers uh, something very personal to her. You know that she uh, was didn't like to talk about. You know, and I respect that. Mm, yeah. Um, my my mother, um, she had been um, having um, sightings, if you will, or encounters since uh, she was 15 years old, and so my mother was very um, very understanding. You know, our family really kind of uh, came together. I would say that you know this was kind of a generational type of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, because my mother was very um, overly supportive. Like we didn't even know why that. You know, when we told her. What happened originally back, you know, when uh, she wasn't involved, you know, in a sighting that my brother and I had, you know, she she knew, you know, and uh, one of the things I'll tell you, though, you know, a lot of the time I'll say that I wasn't really scared or bothered by it, you know, but but I I must have been because at one point I was sleeping with a fork. And um, did you have the lights on? Usually there's like lights on for the next two weeks (laughs) when you fall asleep. (laughs) Well, my mother moved our room, you know, um, where we were right over the kitchen and um, in this uh, large, we had a horse farm, you know, in Sheffield. And um, these older houses, they used to have a grate where you could let the heat in for the upstairs, you know, opened up in the floor and the heat went up. And so she could hear us up there. It is Coast to Coast AM. Connie Willis here with you. How are you tonight? Still have more story to hear here from or encounter. Ah, <laughs> I don't want to say story because it's not a story. It is an encounter. And but, you know, I think that's just a common thing that sometimes we do. And sometimes I obviously do that, too. So joining me tonight is Thomas Reed. He uh, golly, he's done a whole lot of other things too. founder of Miami Models and the son of an attorney and politician. And if you go to his website, you're going to learn a lot more about him. Thomas E. Reed. Thomas E. and then Reed is R-E-E-D dot com. And you'll learn all about him and you can get to all the other uh, uh, pieces of information he's got because he's got a lot going on. In fact, before we get back to the story, if you don't mind, Thomas, can you tell us about you got like a big expo thing going on? Yeah, I was asked to uh, move my uh, UFO Expo, which I used to hold in um, St. Augustine, Florida, uh, to Roswell to help, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess revamp, you know, some of the, uh, you know, the shops and the, that kind of thing that were affected by COVID and, and, and so on and so forth, like a lot of, you know, shop owners were, and to kind of uh, bring back some life to the town a little bit and, and something that would complement their for the July festival. So, yeah, I moved the, uh, the my UFO Expo, which is a, uh, you know, I've got Ben Hansen and Mike Barra, Travis Walton, James Fox, uh, you know, uh, UFO uh, man, the podcast will be there, uh, Tori, um, and uh, uh, the Roswell Daily Record, even Barbara Beck herself, the owner, is going to speak on behalf of the 1947 crash, and Tracy Torme, Daryl Sims, Kim Carlsberg, Steve Bassett, Mark D'Antonio. You know, we're also having a screen, uh, we're screening some films, you know, one from uh, James Fox and Melissa uh, Tittle from Travel Channel. And so uh, we're kind of putting uh, three or four different events together under one roof at the same time to kind of uh, like a film fest and speakers and tracks and that kind of thing. And we're actually we're going to be showing films off the back patio of the convention center onto uh, old classic milk trucks. And so it's going to have like a Vogue feel to it. So I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be something different, you know, for the community. And uh, but it looks like it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Tickets are doing well. And so we're excited about it, and we're excited to be uh, you know part of it. But honestly, yeah. I mean, it's quite an honor to uh, be able to uh, package something like that together and and offer it to the city and and have them be so uh, have it be so well received. So it's uh, yeah, we're excited. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Congratulations with that. Um, uh, now time flies, as you've noticed. Time flies when you're here. Yeah. <laughs> I do see that. So um, I. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, so, I'm trying to really get uh, in uh, in touch and, and uh, tell you exactly what it felt like to be there and everything. But I do. Yeah. There were some medical um, things that happened, and I thought maybe I'd start with that. If, if that's yeah, I want to make sure you get out everything, and I also want to make sure yeah. you talk about the space race and how cool, you know, the big, big, you know, very unique part of it is. But uh, right. take it at your pace. But remember, the pace is a flash that goes by on coast to coast. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I got it. 
All right. So I'm ready where you are. I can just pick up with the medical stuff. But I think ready. Um, Three, two, one. Action. Go. Okay. Okay. I'm, okay. <laughs> so, so to give you an idea of what happened with my family, um, one of the things and why I was on, um, you know, Fox Primetime with Jesse Waters, we were talking about the effects that uh, individuals have when they have a, a close encounter. And I have a very, very um, odd uh, eye issue. Um, both my eyes are um, in terrible shape. And um, my brother and I are like the only ones in our family who not only went bald, you know, in our 20s, um, but we have this odd eye issue. It's, it, now, if I tell you it's a lazy eye, you're going to go, oh, I know what that is when your eye, you know, moves around and doesn't look like your face in the right direction. <laughs> that's, that's not it. Actually, what it is is I um, I, have, I can barely see to read a credit card. So I'll go there a prescription, and when I get my uh, test, um, they'll be like, okay, well, you've got 10, you know, 20, 10 in this eye, whatever it is, stigmatism, whatever. I get my prescription. Everything looks great for about a month. And then my eyes will change. It'll either get better or worse. It's like no matter what prescription I have, which is the correct prescription at the time it's issued to me, within a month or two, my eyes will, uh, you know, just either get better on one side and worse on the other. But it's so dramatic that those glasses are no longer, um, you know, I can't wear them any longer. So now I just wear readers because no matter what prescription I get within a couple of months, and it's not like saying it goes bad like everyone else's. They actually change dramatically. And there isn't an eye surgeon out there. I've been to the Baptist Eye Center. I've had laser surgery. I've been, you know, you name it. This has been going on for, you know, 10 or 15 years now. And so I do have a condition called, it's called a lazy eye, where your eye will not stay, um, you know, corrected. And so the only other person I know that has this issue is Melanie Kirchdorfer, who was also in... Um, you know, Netflix, Berkshire's UFO, and Unsolved Mysteries. She has the same condition I do. And I, I don't know anybody else or heard of anyone else who has anything similar to this. And so she's also the one that remembered the, the, the shell of it, putting out a certain reddish tint, which not many other people had uh, ever mentioned before. So she is authentic, um, I will say that. And um, my brother had two puncture wounds behind his right ear and another two in his chest. Now, he went to a doctor, and he, the doctor had given us a report, which we still have to this day. And what's interesting about those marks, which almost look like snake bites, is that the ones in his chest, if you were to take needles, they would line up with the thymus gland. The thymus gland produces the T cells for your immune system. And those puncture wounds, which are identical to what was on his chest, behind his right ear, line up with where the brain would signal for your body to produce those T cells, which, you know, is something that I guess if you were concerned about getting a virus or something, you would need those T cells to help build up your immune system. So, in other words, you could trigger your body to, uh, your body to, tr to produce those T cells and then with those needles extract T cells themselves. So, that was what we got from that. And, again, that's in a doctor's report. Now, um, the... Uh, like I said, my brother and I are the only ones to have actually gone bald at a very young age. And um, you can't blame that on your dad or your dad's family or whatever. I think no, it comes no, from. No. no, it's something else. When he when he passed at fifty four years old, he had a full head of hair. No, oh, okay. So, or was it your dad's dad or something like that? Isn't that what it is? Was Grandpa yeah. the same way? Um, we're the only two in the family that went bald. That was it. Oh, really? I'm so yeah, sorry. Kinda, kinda, yeah, <laughs> me too. Actually. Blame the aliens, man. <laughs> yeah, I used to be in a band when I was young, and I missed my hair. Um, but anyway, it's um, the look now, though. You're okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's the look. <laughs> yeah. it's and the sunglasses lot. too. So you're good to go across well, the board. Because, yeah, I, I need those. My eyes are set. Yeah. Bad. It's, and and uh, yeah. So the other thing I want to tell you that wasn't mentioned in Unsolved Mysteries was that there were cattle mutilations that night. And, um, mm. and and again, Kevin Titus, who um, was the is the magistrate, and he was a, a judge, and so on and so forth, and a historian. He was one of those kids that used to hang out at our diner when all this talk was happening back in, in the day. And he was over at his friend's house uh, visiting. They were shooting a twenty two rifle in the backyard, actually, at some targets in the woods. And um, when they went, uh, you know, up the hill to shoot, they found these two mutilated cows, and and that is actually on record too. So. If you were to look at that location, um, it would really mean that the craft that was in Berkshire's UFO actually came from Canaan, Connecticut, 
and then went to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and then did a 90 and came back. But it went up the waterway and down the Housatonic River. So it went up and down pretty much uh, over that river, which is why later on it went in support of General Assembly 33426 at the United Nations in support of the Hudson River Valley sightings and, and those encounters. Because, again, that was right maybe you know an hour's drive uh, over also a, a river, the, the Hudson. And so there was some similarities between this case and the Hudson River Valley. Uh, sightings, although the vessels or the crafts were much different. Um, these were primarily uh, round balls of spheres, if you will. Uh, there's been a lot of the orange spheres spotted even to this day. Uh, I actually have some pictures of these spheres that were taken over a cornfield in 2012 or 2013 where these crop circles had showed up in, in Sheffield, not far from the, the park where the incident took place, which is now a park, as you know, uh, with a marker. And so there's still activity to this day, and we, you know, I think that's one of the things that um, is important to the locals and why they're so sensitive, you know, about, you know, how they word things because they were mocked a lot of kids, you know, they went through hell, you know. I know firsthand what it was like, you know. You know, people are standing up on chairs in my mother's diner and, and just being rude about things. If you want to see something out of this world, Nancy, we'll show you something. Out, you know, that kind of thing. And oh, locking, locking no. The, locking the door so people couldn't That's come terrible. in our diner. And But then again, you know, we that diner that my parents had was only about a mile or so from the second largest racetrack to Saratoga. And so if you wanted to bet or you were working for one of these manufacturing facilities like General Electric or Sprague Electric, which manufactured the Goodwill message that was left on the moon by Buzz Aldrin, you know, six weeks after the, the, the September 1st sighting, you know, those people were coming in from New York or Hartford or Albany, New York, and they were working in the Berkshires at the time, which was primarily an area, you know, that was more agricultural, you know, was, you know, corn and that kind of thing. And so there was a big dynamic between um, those who would go to the track and lay down some money on a horse and, and those who wouldn't, you know. And one of the things about our diner that I should mention, because I know I'm probably running out of time, is that... Um, you know, the, 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 the school buses didn't go to each individual home. They would go to corners, and, and you know, the parents would all be out milking, you know, cows and that kind of thing. And then, you know, the wife back in the day usually didn't work, and she would take the, the children to the corner to get the bus. But instead of doing that and having to wait, you know, in this February snow, if you will, they would just bring all the kids to the diner at my mother's restaurant. And back in the day, you would run a cab. You know, my mother would say, oh, so-and-so had this for dinner, or, you know, so-and-so had that for whatever, and at the end of the week, they would pay it off. Well, so all the kids, and, and, and uh, again, you know, Judge Kevin Titus, he was one of those kids that would eat in our diner, who later became a judge who sealed the governor's citation and was also the one who started cattle mutilations. So, so these kids were that came to the diner, and, you know, we had the jukebox. My mother would give them quarters, and they could listen to rock and roll and that kind of thing. Because back in the Berkshires, too, it wasn't like you had a, a radio station in the area. WSBS was just pretty much an AM station who ran some music, too. But if you wanted to listen to the Stones or Credence or whatever, you know, you either went to the bowling alley or you went to our diner, and you threw a quarter or two in the jukebox. And so with all these kids, my mother was like a surrogate parent to them. And so they grew up to be bankers and lawyers and judges and historians. And so when this did go to a vote, you know, through the census, if you will, to the city or the state um, to see if it was significant enough to be deemed historically true in itself, um, some of them played a part in getting this pushed through and getting this inducted. So it was kind of like these kids that rode these little banana seat bikes in the day and were being picked on by a lot of the locals and had a tough time as a child. Mm. Together, they kind of came together. And as a group, they made, you know, they made history. They never wavered, and they made history together. And that's kind of um, the feel for this. You know, if you were to go into that community, that's kind of what they, you know, they respond to. You know, we, we finally have some validation. You know, we, you know, this case was deemed historically true by state government. And, you know, once the United Nations, and unfortunately my father, um, who's, uh, comp, you know, is a, a friend, and uh, someone who worked um, at a neighboring law firm, he was actually my father's lawyer, uh, Robert Fletchman, unknown to us back in the day, you know, he was actually the public relations director for MUFON. And uh, he approached my father to see if uh, he would allow um, Robert to mention this 
at the United Nations in support of General Assembly 33-426. And um, my father, of course, you know, he was out of office now. He had been in two, for two terms, and, and so he gave uh, Robert Bletchman the okay to do it, to talk about it. But he did actually legally uh, retain him. He was just, It was a $500 check at the time. It was back in 1992. Um, but it was just enough to make it legal so that, you know, there was something, uh, you know, formal, if you will, so he couldn't uh, – you know, uh, say too much, you know, get into too much detail, but at least uh, say that, uh, yeah, this happened and, uh, you know, uh, the connection to the space race and that kind of thing and, and how uh, we do feel that what, what happened in the uh, Hudson River could very well be connected to what happened in the Housatonic, you know, um, you know, 10 years earlier. And so, um, so with that, um, you know, uh, you know, Robert mentioned the Reed family incident and um, on October 2nd. And on the anniversary of that date, my father was killed. And out of respect for my my father for advocating the incident, the um, the you know the community, uh, historical society, and and um, and Charles D. Baker and the um, lieutenant uh, governor and um, a few others got together and they decided to um, see what they could do to pay something forward to my father. And um, and that was actually um, a marker at first. And it was a, a, a citation on it, you know. And um, and then um, after um, another uh, meeting with the Historical Society, they had uh, decided to do something further with it. You know, uh, so many people had written letters now and said, "I remember that." And and uh, they found the old, uh, you know, a lot of the old police statements, not really police records, or but uh, when uh, there's a fight at the diner, because uh, like I said, you know these. Fights would break out over the topic, and, you know, and my family. And so when you have those statements or, or what have you, now you've got a paper trail. So you have a paper trail to say, yes, this did take place in the diner. Um, you know, uh, the, it did go out on WSBS, which broadcast that Tom Jay did leave and open up the phone lines and ask for help. People were dispatched to go look for this thing. And it actually divided the community in a way that, you know, some believed it and some didn't, and there were fights and that kind of thing. But at that uh, time, um, that uh, Labor Day incident, 1969, that one kind of put a bow around it, and everybody kind of came together to some degree and said, yeah, you know, we're sorry we treated it that way, or we're sorry, you know, sorry with that we, uh, you know, uh, disrupted your, you know, they would come in with manure on their shoes and stuff. It got to be that and clear the place out. I mean, they were not nice to my family. But after that 1969 incident, it corrected a lot of that. You know, people kind of came together again and said, hey, I'm sorry we picked on you, because we were out of sightings to begin with. We had moved there from New York. And uh, my mother actually went to school with Marion Hartley and was friends with Gin the Ginger, you know, Tina Louise from Gilgan's Island. We moved from that Westport area to the Berkshires. And so we were kind of, you know, not, we didn't really fit in there at first anyway. So it was really <laughs> easy targets for everybody, you know, and, and so it was very, very hard. New Yorkers, yeah, family. come on. Yeah, it was hard for my family. And and so with that, um, you know, it was even we didn't expect the historical society to go to those lengths for us either, but mm. they couldn't deny that our incident had altered the natural progression of the community. And because of the paper trail and because of the attachment polygraph test, they actually took it at the uh, Department of Defense Polygraph Institute, at Advanced Polygraph, and passed that with a 99.1 percent. And um, so with that and uh, the medical records and the the police reports, if you will, their statements, and then the radio archives and those who were, were part of that, um, it went again to a vote, you know, and did, so just like Billy the Kid is how they worded it to us, just like Billy, Billy the Kid, he altered the railroad. So if you alter the natural progression of the community in, 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 in some significant way, the event as a whole was true. And that's how it, it got its um, induction into state as being a historically true event. And then Governor Charles D. Baker rubber stamped that was a citation and uh, left out the date, by the way. So that was rescinded and then reissued uh, about a month later in, in November of 2015. And then um, a mark was put in uh, the park, which uh, Kitchen Aliens actually paid for part of the sign. And um, then it started, was backed by Travis Walton and, you know, uh, Travel Channel and Ben Hansen and the daughter of B.B. King. You know, who's a friend of mine as well. You know, she, uh, you know, she uh, has a bench there. And then the family of Steve Ravon also uh, is involved in sponsoring the park. And and so uh, my Mike Barra, 
you know. Uh, so it became like this little, you know, sponsored area. But for me, it was it's really about my dad. It's about how he advocated this and, and what he went through to get this mentioned at the UN and, and what happened to him. And But at the same time, you know, my family had this judgment-free little diner. And so this park really became an extension of my family's diner. Uh, the, the Roswell Research Library, um, during the time that uh, the uh, historians were looking for the material to put forth for the census to vote on this thing to see if it was you know, uh, worthy of being inducted into state as a true event, they had needed uh, someone to validate a document. They were looking for source documentation. And so they hired the, uh, they didn't actually hire the, the, uh, the Kessler, Kessler law firm got involved and, and went to Roswell and actually went through their records and looked at some of the uh, documents um, in question. Uh, and and uh, so to kind of utilize the research library in, in Roswell to help this event get inducted. And in doing so, uh, Debbie Averman, who was the director of the Historical Society, was actually interviewed um, by the Roswell Daily Record. And so there is a connection there um, with the record and the research library and uh, the state of Massachusetts or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts getting this thing inducted. So that was kind of different, too. And the other thing I wanted to mention that um, a lot of people don't realize this, but NASA used to be based in Boston. So a lot of the money that was being filtered in to be rushed into space was going to NASA in Boston, and that money was being dispersed through Command Aerospace, Pratt & Whitney, um, Sprague Electric, who made the goodwill message that was left on the moon. And many of those people who worked at Sprague and worked on that and everything else would frink with the diner because it was down the road from the racetrack. So there is a link to the space race in our diner as well. And, um, at, you know, and there were a lot of other companies as well that were working, um, making capacitors and that kind of thing. But the rumor has it that it wasn't just uh, capacitors and things that they were making for the space race, that they, a lot of the uh, money was being used to obviously make weapons and everything else. So some of that, uh, I'm sure, it came out of the U.N. And, and who knows what happened to my father, why uh, that happened. But, um, you know, you know um, there's a lot of uh, questions there. Berkshire, Berkshire's, and that is B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E-S-U-F-O, Berkshire's UFO.com. You can learn more. Also, Thomas E. Reed.com. That's where you can kind of go there and shoot out to all of them. Um, that's where you can definitely learn more. All right. Thanks so much, Tom. We'll see you later. Thank you. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.